My name is Sari Robinson. I'm a professor at Oregon State University. Um, I work in the wood science and engineering department. And I work with spalting, which if you're not familiar is when uh, fungi grow on wood and make color. And you've probably all seen spalted wood, you just may not have known what it was. It's, there's a lot of different types. Um, you, maybe you've just seen the whiteness in some of the wood that's kind of soft. We call that uh, white rot or bleaching. Um, the wood usually loses a bit of its structural capacity at this stage, but if done properly, the wood can remain sound and uh, it can be a really nice effect, as you see in this piece of burl here, the differences between the white and the dark areas. Wood turners especially seem pretty fond of uh, zone lines, which are, in this piece, black. They're not always black. Sometimes they're green or yellow or orange. Um, and they're these sort of winding black lines or patches of, of black that mean a whole bunch of different things. They can be where two fungi came together and delineated their resources because they were of equal strength and didn't want the other fungus on their property. Uh, when you start seeing things like this, these tend to be more environmental zone lines. Uh, fungi can make these lines to help protect against moisture loss, uh, to deal with various things they don't like in the wood. There's lots of reasons that they will make zone lines. But the neat thing is that these are not decayed in any way. The area around them is usually pretty decayed, but zone lines themselves are quite solid, which if you're a wood turner is really frustrating because you get pockets of soft and then hard and then soft and then hard when you're trying to turn, which makes you angry. <laughs> So those are the, definitely the two most common. You know, this one, pulled out some neat examples. This is what just really nice white rot looks like. So again, I know a lot of people are really into the zone lines, but it's important not to overlook just the beauty of white rot when it models like this. Some of you may be familiar with blue stain. So this is on a buckeye burl. But blue stain is really common, especially in the pines. Almost any wood can blue stain. It's interesting to note that this color isn't really blue. It's the same. Uh, melanin type stuff that's in the zone lines, but it's a different molecular weight. So when the light hits the wood, it refracts off and appears blue. Um, we don't consider this a true pigment, but it also doesn't decay the wood. So blue stained wood is usually quite sound and won't explode on the lathe if you're trying to turn it or break off in your machine. Now, the things they don't have examples of, and I didn't even think to bring them, are pigmented wood, which is stuff that I think a lot of people tend to overlook in terms of spalting. Spalting isn't just white rot and zone lines and some blue stain. It can be pink, it can be yellow, it can be purple. All the colors of the rainbow pretty much are possible on wood if you know which fungi to use. I asked them to get this piece not because, so this is box elder. Box elder is not spalting. Um, this color is caused by the tree. It's not caused by a fungus. But we do have fungi that can make this color. So if you pretend this isn't box elder for a minute, this is a color that you can get. Uh, pinks, yellows, purples, greens, all possible with a little knowledge on how to do it. So I spent, I don't even know, 10, 11 years researching this. Um, and so it used to be that people would take their wood out and they'd bury it in leaves and come up with some kind of crazy recipe. Everyone's got recipes, right? Leaves and beer and ground reindeer antlers and miracle grow. I don't even know what all people put in. <coughs> Um, and then they'll always say, oh, and it only takes a year or two years to spalt wood. So from the get-go, if you have the fungi, the right fungi, and you control your conditions, it takes about 12 weeks. So that's a big benefit from not burying it. In the lab, um, with where we're at now in our research, we can do it in about an hour to two hours. Really? For you guys, if you're interested in, in spalting at home, it's incredibly easy. I mean, incredibly, incredibly easy. It's a natural process, so you're not doing anything weird to the wood. All you're doing is sort of uh, speed dating and picking the right combination of wood species and fungus because certain fungi prefer certain wood species and if you get a good match you're gonna have great spalting right off the bat. The other trick is to not fuss around with burying it or just letting the random fungi come in. If you can actually get the right fungus right off, you cut all that time down almost entirely. So when I mean straight up fungus, I don't mean going into the woods and picking a mushroom. I mean, either if you have the skill picking that mushroom and making a culture of it, or buying a culture, this saves you a crazy amount of time. If you have the actively growing form of the fungus already available, putting this on the wood then takes all the time from the mushroom to start growing and getting activated into the wood. 
So these are really good if you actually want to do spalting at home and have reliable results. You can spalt anything because all wood decays, right? So in theory, you can spalt anything. If it's darker wood, it usually takes longer, not because it takes longer to decay, but because you can't see it quite as quickly. So if you want to turn a walnut pink, it's going to be a while because you need a lot of pink pigment in order to be able to see it through that brown color. Maple's a great wood for spalting because it's relatively strong and it's pale and things show up really, really quickly. If you have no patience whatsoever, <laughs> things like aspen and poplar and cottonwood spalt really, really well because they have no real natural decay resistance. So the fungi just go to town. But you can't forget about it because those woods, especially if you include birch in that category, just go from solid to mush in about a day and a half. Mm -hmm. So if you're attentive or you can make some sort of schedule, uh, you'll be fine. Otherwise, if you're more the forgetful type, things like maple uh, tend to do a little. You, you can leave them alone for longer. Um, if you want to spalt things like madrone, again, it's a little bit, you know, it's a more solid piece of wood. It just takes a little longer. But in general, 12 weeks is on average for the stuff you guys would be doing. Um, for us in the lab, it no longer matters because we have a whole bunch of different uh, techniques to use. But generally for you guys, you shouldn't take anything much longer than 12 weeks if you're working with an actual culture. That's the lowdown and dirty on spalting. I'm kind of curious what questions you have. Yeah. So how would you how would you get it to start spalting? Would you just paint this on and then set it set it aside, or do you need to enclose it in a, a plastic bag or anything like that? The best part about active cultures is it doesn't matter how you get it on the wood as long as it gets on the wood. Okay. So um, you know I'd stick my finger in here, but I know some of you are squeamish, so <laughs> a knife or a toothpick or something and uh, literally just scoop it out, pop it on the wood. Um, generally, it'll go a lot better for you if you clean cut a surface first because there's a lot of fungi in the air all the time. And they land and they can outcompete a lot of these. So if you give it a nice clean cut, you're kind of taking off all the surface garbage and then you can put this on. Your wood has to be wet for it to spalt. It doesn't have to be green, so it doesn't have to be fresh cut. You can use kiln dried lumber and make it wet again but you need to be shooting for at least around 30% moisture content if you want the fungi to do anything. Um, once you have it wet, fungi like dark, and it's best if you can minimize airflow. Because again, all that stuff in the air is gonna try and outcompete your fungus. So the less airflow you can have on it, the better. So if you have a big barn, don't sticker your wood. Stack it tight to keep airflow minimized. Um, if you're a wood turner, those plastic bins from Walmart are by far your best option because they're very clean to begin with and you can sanitize them with alcohol very easily. Um, and you can just put your turning blanks, your pre-cut turning blanks in, stack them real tight, put fungus in between like little sandwiches, and it just goes to town. You have to make sure that your wood stays at a pretty good moisture content. So um, if you're using a bin, I like to make sure that there's you know about this much water at the bottom just, just to make sure that nothing dries out because those lids aren't airtight. You know, things will dry over time. And you'll notice that there'll be a spalting gradation in your tub. The things that are in the water won't spalt. The things that have excellent access to the water will spalt really well and the stuff on the top won't. So you can just rotate, um, I'd say every month or so. But the more you fuss with the bin, the slower the fungi will grow. They don't like to be disturbed. They're delicate little things. You just put it right on the end of it and paint it on the end, huh? You know, paint it, you know, it's not like you have to spread it around. Just chunk it somewhere. Oh. I usually take a piece, put a big lob, take another piece, mash them together and stick them in. Oh. This, um, despite the fact that I've been researching this for 11 years, is not rocket science. It's incredible to me that no one's doing this commercially because it's so incredibly easy. Once the fungus is on the wood, it's going, as long as your wood is wet. And there's really relatively little you can do to screw it up. Um, assuming you aren't doing it outside when it's winter, or not watering your wood, or leaving it in sunlight. Fungi don't like light. That would be a bad idea. Yeah. Does it matter if you put the uh, your fungus on end grain only, or on the side, or? For the purposes of what you guys are doing, not really. There's maybe a week or two time differential in terms of where you place it, but since you guys are doing it in tubs um, over the course of you know 12 to say 16 weeks. It's pretty much irrelevant. Do you put different colors in the same tub? Uh, so that's a really good question. If you're trying to get a rainbow of colors, 
This is uh, an interesting process because a lot of these fungi by nature don't play nice together. So if you put them too close to each other, they'll just try and kill each other and, and won't do too much. In general, the ones that make the, the nice white rot and the zone lines, you want them to interact because that's how you get the zone lines. Um, so you can put all of those together on a piece of wood as much as you want. Um, and there are some of the more aggressive pigmenters, like the red one that makes this sort of color, that can interact with the big boys just fine. But others, um, this is Manascus, so this is a pink, and uh, the yellows, and the blues, and the greens are definitely more of a second stage colonizer type of fungus. So if you want to do those, you need to take your wood out of the bin where you've been zone lining it, dry it, because that'll kill everything. Um, and I don't mean kiln drying, I mean just let it dry out. And then put it in a new bin um, that doesn't have those in it, and then put the colored fungi on. People asking me, is it harmful to breathe the spot? No, 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 no. <laughs> This is probably one of the greatest urban legends, I think, that's out there at the moment, is the dangers of spalted wood. Um, so remember that there's fungi in the air all the time. I mean, especially if we're out in the woods right now. Jesus, the amount of fungus you're breathing in is astronomical. <laughs> every, people are like, wait, what? <laughs> if you're okay with this, you shouldn't have any problems with spalted wood. But remember, too, that... Spalting fungi, at least ours, are specifically chosen because they grow inside wood, not on top of wood. Airborne molds and the stuff that everyone's always so concerned about, that's surface colonization. Those aren't spalting fungi. So if you're using stuff from the forest, um, I can't guarantee what's on it. It probably does have surface mold on it, but most of the time you don't just pick it up and toss it on a lathe. You cut pieces of the sides off and you're cutting all that garbage off. If it bugs you, um, in the lab, we use 91% isopropyl alcohol, which costs about $2 at Walmart to sanitize. You can just hose your wood down. That kills everything. But uh, a lot of our white rot fungi are actually edibles. Uh, Trimides versicolor is one of our biggest ones. It's used in Chinese herbal medicine. People eat it all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, our pigment ones, you know, there's, there's absolutely no problem with them. Also, they're inside the wood. So they're a whole different class of fungus. So... I know that there's a lot of people who will say, you know, I know a guy who know, knew a guy who turned spalted wood for 20 years and he got a horrible lung infection and he died. So I want to remind you all that wood dust is a terrible carcinogen. Like it will screw you up. And so if you've been turning wood or planing wood or sanding wood for 20 years and you haven't been wearing a mask, that is not my fault. It's just so not my fault. <laughs> You should always be wearing a mask when you do anything with woodworking, especially sanding. And I'm talking about like a Neosh 95 or higher type of mask. If you're wearing one of those, there's no reason you would get any of these in your lungs to begin with. So you're safe. Don't worry. It's fine. Yeah. So the gel that's in the bottom? This is malt agar. It's, it's a food? Yeah, it's agar is made from seaweed. It's kind of like a jello. So are the spores all throughout that stuff and not just the color stuff on top? Or you got to be that tricky with the word spores. That's... Or, okay, the, <laughs> the fungus? The fungus is in here. Not all fungi produce spores in culture. I know spores is like a big word that people toss around because they're like, oh my god, the spores are going to kill me. <laughs> Most of, I would say 90% of these are not sporulating at all because they don't sporulate in culture. There are a few exceptions. So these are the active life stage, so the hyphae, making a mycelial mat. And so that's what's in here, and they're eating the, this is barley malt, and water, and agar. And agar is kind of like a super gelatin. If, you, um, if you're really into spalting, um, so I have business cards, and there's a website on there that actually shows you how to make this food so you can transfer the cultures. Generally, when people want to do spalting, they buy the, the base culture, not these are last year's again, but the good cultures cost about 100 bucks, and... One lasts you for the rest of your life because you copy it routinely onto new food and it just keeps growing. Um, so, yeah, the food's really good. These, again, are not meant to be copied because they're old. They're just meant for straight inoculation. But if you're super excited about spalting and really want to do it, then I would suggest getting a good culture and not last year's cultures. More exciting questions on spalting? It sounds kind of like sourdough starter. Yeah, that's, it's pretty much just like getting a yogurt starter or a sourdough starter. So how much would it, I mean, how much would it take, say, for a, between a small piece like that, two by two there, and that big giant this? piece behind it? Yeah. I mean, if you were going to put that onto it, would you put a small drop, or would you kind of put it in several places? Um, how, what um, kind of quantity would you use? 
There's no, I mean, a little, it only takes a tiny, tiny piece okay. to get into the wood. It'll just, the more you put on, the faster it'll go, generally, to a point. once you put it on, it's going to spread. On yeah, itself. it spreads exponentially. Oh, okay. So, you know, if I had this piece and this piece, I'd probably use half of one piece and just stick them and mash it around. Okay. For something like this, I might use a whole one. Again, if you're going to, like, industrially spalt, you get a good one of these and then make really big batches and do it. So, you know, you can't go out into the woods and usually find too much brightly colored wood. It's very rare. Those fungi are kind of delicate. They take a while to get going and they're really hard to keep going in the lab. So a lot of that money goes to paying our undergraduates to actually keeping them alive, which is a giant pain. Mm -hmm. Which is why every time someone's like, oh, the fungi are going to kill me, I'm like, we can't even keep them alive. <laughs> That's not what they're going to do to you. <laughs> We've kind of come around a corner with spalting at this point. For a long time, we were doing these inoculations, and this is still what we recommend for people who are you know, just in it for a hobby. But right now in the lab, um, we figured out how to actually extract the pigments directly out, so we don't have to do a growing stage on the fungus. We can keep the pigments in solution and reapply them to the wood, so we can spalt in about an hour. And that's amazing. And these pigments have crazy properties that we were just completely unprepared for. And so we're finding a lot of applications in glass dyeing and fabric dyeing and, um, you know, they, they fluoresce and we're going to be able to use them for markers and just crazy stuff.